All right, so my name is Hermie Smith, and uh, we're here in, at Trinity, um, Trinity? Trinity, just Church. Trinity, uh, Trinity Church in Sunnyvale, California. Um, the reason, you know, Rob Schultz and I, probably about, what, a year ago, year and a half ago, we had this dream, you know, as God is putting some, um, the puzzle, the great puzzle pieces together here in the Bay Area, especially with Transform the Bay with Christ coming you know, bringing um, the Christian, the, the capital C church together, we thought, how cool would it be if we start to bring some of these like-minded, you know, Great Commission type folks together and, you know, have kind of like a, a catalytic team that then start to mobilize a team that looks like Luke 10, where Jesus, you, you know, that 72 when he sends him out to towns and places wherever he is to go, to prayerfully look for those persons of peace and then make disciples that looks like the Great Commission, that makes other disciples, that obey, that makes other disciples. And how cool would that be? And, and then if we can provide kind of like a model that and some language and that can also speak to others. So this is happening, I think this is what, the fourth time we, we, yeah. we, we met together. Yeah. And uh, I'm excited because Tom and I got a little bit of a sneak peek last week when we met with you. Yeah. And um, help me prove. <clears throat> yeah. Prepare. So uh, this, is, this is another, you know, uh, Pastor Mark, you're going to share a little bit. What are your plans as we, um, a little bit from where you're at and what your plans have mobilized part of that 72 to where people live, work, and play, specifically where they, where they work. Yeah. So really keen to hear what you're going to say. And then, you know, we'll brainstorm on, you know, give him some feedback. And yeah. uh, we'll also rally around, you know, um, how we can kind of like advance this goal for reaching the Bay Area and mo equipping and mobilizing more people to get in the game where they live, work, learn, and play to make disciples. So I'm going to transfer this yeah. over. Thank you, Mark. Great. So this presentation might be really helpful for people who are just in the process of thinking about how to take a traditional kind of ministry and leaving in dis disciple making principles or um, you know discovery bible study type evangelism principles so um, let me hand out my little packet to you guys just a little background my wife and i were on staff with intervarsity christian fellowship for 24 years and uh, served a lot of different campuses and um, we're in management and all that uh, started at the River Church community in San Jose in 2008. That church had been planted in the late 90s with 20-somethings. But by 2008, uh, we had lost touch entirely with people under 35. So the youngest people in the church were about 35 at that point. And um, one of my instincts was that's a dangerous sign. When, you, when your church is, you got, you got high schoolers and then nothing in between that and 35 people with their young children. So, uh, you know, as an executive pastor, I don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, our church at that time was like 230 people. So I'm the right-hand guy for our lead pastor. So I'm covering children's ministry, youth ministry, uh, you know, this, and then supervising adult spiritual formation in general. So adult small groups in general. But um, I noticed that in the summers, uh, young adults showed up at church and they would check us out for a few weeks and then leave. And so what I made a decision to do was I would uh, meet as many of them as I could on Sundays and take them to lunch. So I just blocked out my lunches for the entire summer and I, with the goal that by the middle of the summer that I'd be able to start a discipleship group in my own home with people completely new to our church. And uh, people move to Silicon Valley, they graduate, get a job, uh, and they move to Silicon Valley in the summer. So that's the time when, especially single people, you know, and people with little kids too, but um, this when people are ripe, right? So that there's this, this moment in their lives in which they're really ready. So in 2011, so if you look on the, uh, the back actually, you could see that in 2011, uh, I started what, a group that they named themselves Thursday Night Lights, which at that time was a really popular TV show. And there was another group that was pre-existing, which is kind of a control group, because it was a group of about eight people that was 
on Tuesdays, and I had no influence or really relationship with them. There are a group of people that just met as a Bible study, people in their 20s, and, and they were kind of doing their own thing. So in 2011, um, I started this group, and we started with about eight people, and then within two years, it had grown to about 30. And so uh, that's when I multiplied the group and appointed leaders, and I began coaching. So um, that was in January 2013. And then you can look downstream now where uh, I've finally influenced. It took me six years to change the DNA of the Tuesday group to where they would actually open themselves up to newcomers and invite their friends to the group, and then to the point where they're willing to multiply. Uh, one of the things that, that we see in Silicon Valley is that because relationships are so transitory, people are, when they get a group and they get friends, they're desperate to keep them. And so there's very little desire or motivation for groups to multiply. So that's a huge issue. Um, so that group, it's taken me six years to actually build, like having them compare to what I was doing, and they saw the fruit and they thought, wow, that's something we want to be part of. So um, downstream, you could see that uh, I've multiplied the group uh, once, then one of those groups multiplied. Uh, there should be a line between Thursdays at the table and Mountain View. So that multiplied a group into Mountain View. Then I began a short-term group. So I started the, the idea of, I'm just going to do a, a, a short-term group in 2015, and our church was doing a spiritual gifts emphasis. So I started a group. Uh, with about 15 people that were just kind of on the margins. And I reached out to them, got them together. And then after a summer of them being together and, and working on their gifts and passions, was able to multiply that into two groups. What, they started originally calling themselves the best small group ever. And then when they multiplied, the other one called itself best small group ever, number two. <laughs> so then I've started again uh, with a group that we're calling Design You. And this is a discipleship program for people immediately out of college uh, some of them haven't even gotten their job yet. A lot of them are living at home or they're living in, in you know, like a flop house arrangement with about six people. And this is to really focus on bringing people from college life into adult life and into discipleship through that. So, you know, we started with about 15 young adults and now we're up to about uh, 120 or 125 and in that period, I went through and I counted everybody who's left. We've only had 30 people leave the church or the area. And in Silicon Valley, the average 20-something moves every two years. And um, a lot of them are very loosely attached to any church. So the fact that this has rooted people in a community, it's brought them into discipleship, it's brought them into uh, a transformative experience. So um, back on the front there, so our... Uh, you know, this was built out of my own DNA of my own ministry years at Stanford uh, with college students. With, I, not, I had not read any of the disciple-making movement stuff when I started this in 2011. So, you know, I've just been learning in the last two years about the disi disciple-making movement stuff. So our DNA is shaped very much by a strong culture of hospitality, cross-cultural friendship, uh, discipleship to Jesus in community. So the whole idea is it's a team of people following Jesus together and helping each other. Uh, evangelism and specifically prayer for unreached people or friends of ours that are not experiencing much of Jesus. So this group is very allergic to saying even the word non-Christian. Yeah. So what we say is praying for those, to, as far as we know, who have very little experience of Jesus, who are not experiencing much of the goodness of God in their lives. Because this group, they, the millennials, they don't want to make any barriers between anybody. So everybody belongs because they, they have this very strong sense that we all have to be together. But they're very aware that they've experienced more of Jesus than a lot of their friends. So they're happy to talk about that as an organic category, not a false dichotomy between a Christian and a non-Christian. Mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so we have a very strong emphasis on personal healing and growth because a lot of these guys come out of very broken families um, their relationships are serial and percussive. Um, they become very bonded to a group of people, and then there's a blow-up in that set of relationships, and then they fragment apart, and then they wonder why they, they do that over and over. So we have a very strong uh, value on people looking at their family of origin, looking at what has caused them to 
be the kind of person that they are today in terms of lack of ability to connect and hold those connections in covenant relationship. And then uh, the last thing there that I want to mention is we have a very strong sense uh, that 20-somethings uh, are wasting their life in our culture. That, um, you know, you've heard the term 30 is the new 20. And, and that's a completely a destructive force. And I don't even use the word emerging adult. They don't like that term. They, they prefer to be called young adult because I'm young, but I am an adult. So the time emerging adult is like saying you're just, you're just a glorified teenager. So uh, the, the whole notion of the 20s is the most critical decade for development in your life. There's an author uh, at UC Berkeley uh, named Meg Jay, and her, all of her research is on that, that the course of your life is really set by what you do in your 20s. That, that th that's the critical decade for beginning healthy relationships, beginning a healthy career, beginning to make an impact in society, beginning to have uh, a developmental perspective about yourself, that you're not just about fun or you're not just about experiences. Um, and so that's actually, that, that could feel like a little bit like bad news, like, hey, come and join this discipleship program um, because you're, you're wasting your 20s. But it's actually good news because they want to hear that, that, they're, that what they're doing right now really matters. And so I have a very strong urgency that how, you're, how your inner life is going, how your ministry life is going, how your career is going, how you're dealing with your issues from your life, how you're handling money, uh, how you're relating to people in community, that those are, if you don't make radical progress in your 20s, you are going to be crippled. And, and you're going to be playing catch-up ball the rest of your adult life. So the strengths of our, our ministry is interconnected with our entire church. So this group that I've uh, been gifted to start, we are the youth ministry. So we have a youth pastor, but these are the 12 to 14 young adults who make our youth ministry really discipleship-oriented. Um, that, that, you know, youth ministries, for the, I, whoever, whoever was responsible for creating these ultra-large youth groups with very few adults involved uh, should be fired and never allowed to work in a church again because that's what's led to the mass exodus of young people from the church in America. That, you know, we need to have at least one discipling adult for every five youth. Um, and every youth needs five to seven mature Christian adults in their life for them to flourish. So this group has really taken on that vision of helping youth make the transition to adulthood as Christians. They staff our children's ministry. They are the worship team at our church. So, um, you know, when you look on stage on a Sunday morning, there's maybe one or two people that look like adults. Everybody else looks like, is that person in college? Um, and then there's intergenerational relationship mentoring where older people are sowing into them in our church. We, I bridge them into relationships with people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. So we have a very strong scripture study and application-based uh, discipleship versus video curriculum or any kind of canned curriculum. So uh, none of our people will, will sit still for anything that's on a video. Uh, Francis Chan, yeah, they'll hear our YouTube of him, but when they come together, they want to open the word and look at it together. Um, uh, you know, there's a strong kind of connection between worship, justice, uh, developing ministry together, a strong sense of community, uh, and having an inner life. So it's not just one thing. We're not just like worshiping and then trying to get people married which is what most college or young adult ministries are doing. So we're trying to build all of these ingredients in. We have a very strong multi-ethnic component. If you're not able to be strong friends with people of other cultures, you're not going to be very comfortable in this group. Um, and that's just, it matches Silicon Valley. That uh, we have South Asians, Latinos, Chinese, some Anglos, um, multiple East Asian varieties of people who are all pursuing Jesus together. Uh, so there's a very strong every member ministry. So we have women small group leaders. And I know for some churches that's a problem, but in our, in our context, you know, women preach, women lead. You know, every member needs to be involved using their gifts. Um, and then in terms of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the thing, we don't have multiplication. We have mitosis. So people were using the term like, oh, we're going to multiply our group. And I says, no, what you're going to do is mitosis. Multiplication would be if every one of you started a group, and every, everyone 
of those people started a group. That's multiplication. We don't have multiplication. So I've started to leaven in the language of disciple-making movements and catalytic uh, viral disciple-making. Uh, so we meet in homes. We don't ever use the church property for anything except large, pro large parties because the chances that their neighbor would come that night uh, to a, a, a potluck or something is really critical that, that they live in apartments and they are connected to the other people there. And, and that people see the ministry happening versus at a church. Um, and then there's a very entrepreneurial culture. So I have people that come to me and say, I want to start up a justice thing. And I say, amen, let's do it. What do you want to do? Okay, well, let's coach you. I'm going to connect you with three other people. So the river has a very entrepreneurial thing, which 20-somethings love because they have a sense like, I could do anything here and I could get supported. So there's no sort of like, oh, put an application in, we'll send it to a committee and then the board will talk about it. You know, as long as you don't destroy the building, you can do anything here. Um, weaknesses. Uh, as long as I was currently leading the group, evangelism was strong. Uh, but the moment I began coaching, uh, evangelism wanes. Because, uh, you know, it's, we live in a Silicon Valley culture, and most people are working in high tech. And then the, the kind of, I call it drinking the Kool-Aid. You drink the Kool-Aid, and you basically believe everybody in Silicon Valley is a good person. They have their own faith. They have their own tradition. So I'll just be a good employee. And then if they ever ask me about what's the hope that you have, then I'll tell them about Jesus. But that never happens, right? So um, that's one of our problems. So uh, the idea that every disciple is making disciples is viewed as optional because I didn't convert most of these people. So the ones that, that have come to Christ through the ministry, they have that because they, you know, they're wide open, but almost everybody in their 20s came to Christ in some other context in America. Um, my lack of uh, time and bandwidth to be hands-on uh, is, is one of the other weaknesses because it's such a small percentage of my job. Um, the idea of we study the scriptures and apply it versus I obey my master Jesus. That's a subtle difference, but those who grew up in Bible study, observation, interpretation, application, the idea is I am taking the word and I am applying it to my life. That's very different than at the end of a group time saying, let's all be quiet and listen to our Lord and what he's telling us to do tomorrow with what we've just heard. So that, that sense of, of instant obedience to a living person. And some people have that and some people don't, but that's hard to sustain uh, with people. Uh, personal prayer and an inner life is always under threat in Silicon Valley. There's very uh, little uh, uh, pull other than yoga classes for people to ever do anything that is quiet. And especially people in their 20s have a hard time. And then it's a theologically and analytically shallow group. So people do not think deeply about the LGBT stuff. They don't think deeply about why our culture despises the Christian brand and whether that's a real true estimation of how Christians are living. Um, so there's some transferable principles, but just in the interest of time, I want to go to the, the system. So if you look at this, this, this one. So where are people coming from? So people are coming from colleges. So um, there's an, uh, a Christianity Today author uh, who I really love. Her name is um, Naomi Schaefer Riley. She's written a book on millennials. And um, this interview in Christianity Today, uh, let me see, what date was that, just for people who want to look it up? July 2014, uh, on It Takes More Than a Swank Coffee Shop to Reach Millennials. One of the things her, her research shows is that when people leave college, they are more uh, available to be involved in Christian life than they will ever be for the rest of their 20s. So if we are not catching them the moment they graduate, then we are losing a huge percentage of people that otherwise would be involved in discipleship. Um, so we are very uh, intentional about uh, networking through the InterVarsity movement in California, the crew uh, uh, movement in California, um, uh, international fellowships. So on almost every college campus, there's some South Asians or East Asians that have started a church on campus or two or three of those kind of things. So we network very intentionally through our alumni with those groups and let them know we are going to invest in these people. If they show up at our church, they will be invested in. They will not just sit there. Um, uh, we have an, another ministry uh, connected to our church called Servant Partners, which is a Christian order among the poor. 
and we have a two-year internship at our church. So every year, or every two years, 10 new people come for that internship, and they work in the poorest neighborhood in San Jose. And they're attached to our church, but they're, they're basically living out their faith in the Latino uh, impoverished neighborhood of the Washington neighborhood. So when they come into our system, they're coming in through a Yelp search, a Google ad, or a friend's recommendation through Facebook or something like that. That's, I ask them, how did you find us? And those are the three ways that they're finding us. Um, so what we do with them, so the, the number one thing we do is we put them in a small group discipleship community. Um, then there's mentoring involved. We have a 10-week class called The Healing Path that is really a, it's a healing 101 that helps them look at their family of origin, helps them look at their uh, sexual addictions, helps them look at a variety of other things that can destroy us and, and, and defeat us in life. Um, and, and, and every single person uh, who comes into the young adult discipleship will take that program in, in their like, first two years with us. If you've been in it with us for three years and you haven't done it, you're not going to get a word from me. You'll get a word from your peers. Your peers will say, you haven't been to Healing Path yet? What are you doing? you got to get into Healing Path. Um, so that, that's a really good DNA element. And then um, uh, everybody's uh, really strongly involved in service. So the whole notion of not being involved in service uh, is, is not good. So like I said, not everybody feels that they should be a disciple who makes disciples, but everybody knows that they need to be in ministry and using their gifts. Um, so, um, uh, and then departure. So people leave the system in a variety of ways. Uh, they can't afford to live in Silicon Valley anymore. So I've had 30 people leave the system since 2011. About eight of them have left because they couldn't afford Silicon Valley anymore, and almost all of them are married couples. So married couples decide they're going to take the job in, um, in Michigan because they can buy a four-bedroom house, where here they couldn't even buy a mobile home. Um, people leave for graduate school or a job transfer. That's a lesser percentage, but it, it still exists. Uh, I've had only, I counted another one. We've only had two people leave the Christian faith uh, in the last six years from this population, uh, which I consider to be a huge success because our, um, you know, the average in, in our culture is about 20% in five years of this age group leave the Christian faith in America. So um, we're not necessarily dynamically reaching the unreached, but we're stopping the blood flow, right? So that's a big part of this. Um, a couple of people have left another church because of a romantic relationship, and then we've had two couples have their first baby, and that pretty much throws a, a, a wire into everything, and then they get thrust into the adult small group system at our church, which has a very different DNA. So in our adult small group, we haven't been able to multiply or do a mitosis of a single small group in the seven years that I've been there. So, you know, it's impossible to get people. Now, we've had people leave, to, like a, two people will leave to start a group. Uh, they might leave their small group to start a group. We can get that, but we can't get a group of 16 people to split into two groups of eight or send five out or something like that. It's just, it's, um, people are, there, you know, it's so hard to keep friends here. Um, and you know, husband and wife both working 50 hours be makes it very difficult for people to give up something that's really good. Um, we've sent three into international mission. So that's, that's about... Uh, so my questions for this, uh, uh, you guys, are on, on the second page there. How can DMM be introduced in a matrix? Can it be introduced in a matrix with the small group system? Or begun in a does it need to be begun in a parallel t tangential way, where I'm recruiting people out of these groups to be uh, to do DMM type type stuff, uh, and how would that affect these groups if I'm pulling out maybe the most evangelistic people in in those groups? Um, you know, so that's my big question. And then the other question is, does it need to be blown up? It's a beautiful thing. The relationships will continue. Uh, you know, if I try to blow it up you know, that's going to be, you know, some people will be devastated. Some people will feel like, oh, it was so good. This was such a great ministry. Um, why did you have to kill it, you know? So that's, that's another, that's a, that's a big dilemma that I have. Um, my other question is, is anyone in Silicon Valley seeing evangelistic fruit among secular majority culture Silicon Valley 20 professionals? Because uh, I don't know anybody who is. 
Um, you know, I know Andy Wood is doing, you know, their church, South Bay, is doing a lot of advertising. They're pretty much doing the same thing we're doing. They're bringing in people post-college who've been Christians, moved to the area for jobs, and, you know, he's building a large church with those people. I, I'm, I have questions about how much discipleship an average person is getting in a, in a Sunday morning driven experience. I think that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a losing formula ultimately if we want these people to be developed. Um, can we mobilize entrepreneurial teams to work with open people groups? So another thought that I have is take some of the South Asians and, and see if we can work with the H-1B visa guys who are all along First Street. So there's about 10,000 Indian professionals all along First Street. If you've ever had lunch at eBay or at Cisco, you know what I'm talking about. You go in the cafeteria and you think that you're in Mumbai. So it's just not the same. Uh, you know, a, a lot of those folks have no faith or they're questioning the whole, the whole issue of their Hindu background or whatever they came out of. Uh, and then other immigrants who have not drunk the Kool-Aid yet of, of kind of majority culture. You know, the co converts that we've had have been like Vietnamese, uh, young men and women, Latinos. So those people are the people that, you know, in this group have been the people that have come to Christ. We, one white person in, in my five years with this has become a Christian. And then, uh, m you know, my own, uh, my own ministry role is going to change over the course of this next 12 months. I'm going to be moving more into uh, kind of overseas stuff. And so my question is, how do I uh, understand my relationship, having been the spiritual father of this group of people, uh, probably not going to hire somebody who's going to be a young adult pastor. We'll have a, a couple different people in the small group. But, you know, I can appoint leaders from within it um, to be coaches, could bring someone like Tom in uh, to really help, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the future should hold. Um, so, and then I've got other, other questions about, you know, uh, just what are the critical growth steps? So, um, then I've, I've listed there t Meg Jay's book, You're Defining Decade, Why the 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now, and then her TED Talk, which is, you know, a good place to start if you want to take a look at, so. So any, any questions that you guys have before you get to my questions? Take care, Ben. Mark, great job. I really, Thanks, Rob. I felt like a certain amount of time got a really good grasp of your uh, young adult ministry. Thanks. And encouraging, I mean, there's, yeah, there's things you want to do, but boy, I mean, it's encouraging to see what's happened. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a real, I mean, um, People, you know, some of the adults were skeptical that I was spending a significant amount of my time on this at the beginning, and now they feel like, well, where would our church be if you hadn't done this? This is just such a huge blessing. Our youth ministry would just be a mess because we can't get enough adults. We don't have any retired people. So our church, one of the things you know, it's like you come to our church, there's maybe three or four couples above uh, 60. There's like one small group of people in their 60s and 70s and very few of them uh, in our church. So we don't have kind of like the retired people that an average church has. Mm -hmm. So that's a real problem because almost everybody's a two-income couple. And it's very hard to do ministry. Yeah. You know, you end up in a staff-driven model without these 20-somethings. Yeah. So. Yeah, thanks for putting all that also. You can, you can tell that this, this demographic is also very strategic. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I do think if we want DMM to work in this culture, you know, We've seen it, you guys at City Team have seen it with people in recovery mm -hmm. because they are desperate for anything. It's life and death for them, and they're ready to start, yeah. right? But the other people that you might, you know, that I think we could see it with is youth because youth right now, like, you know, half of the seventh grade girls in America are porn addicted, right? Yes. People, people think it's a boy's problem, but all the recent research in, in, in youth ministry, the Pew studies and all this, Half of the seventh grade girls are porn addicted. We have, we, have regular, we have regular confession times at our youth ministry where kids, sixth grade girls, homeschooled sixth grade girls, will write on, on a slip of paper, I am porn addicted, please help me. And they'll put that in the box with their name in a confession time. And then one of our, so one of the things is, you know, every one of our youth ministry people from our young adult group, having been through the healing path, they, you, one, of the, one of the checkpoints is, if you are not willing to talk about your sexual failures, you cannot be a minister in our youth ministry. 
If you're not willing to get up and talk about your homosexual past or your uh, porn addicted past or your uh, you know, multiple serial uh, tender life in college, if you're not willing to talk about the destructive things that you've done with your body, that you can't minister to our youth because they need hope. They need hope that there is some hope for them because they're in the throes of it. They're messed up. So, so it's, it's, it, it is such a critical thing with youth in our culture. Cause, and they do feel like it's a life and death, right? The youth uh, you know, in our culture, it's so painful. We talked about the, the gun high school suicides. That's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, I mean, my kids were at Cupertino High. There was multiple suicide attempts at Cupertino High, but it's all kept out of the news. Nobody ever talks about it because they're terrible. They're terrified of a gun high school thing where kids have jumped in front of a train. Well, you can't keep kids jumping in front of a train out of the news. But in other you know, high schools, so we have a terrible suicide problem. We have a cutting problem. We have a porn addiction problem. We've got all different kinds of youth issues in America. And youth know that they need help. They need, they need salvation. Um, and then I think college is another really critical age. If we could maybe you know, open this circle here to a lot of the campus ministry people, I think uh, you know, it would be great for me to try to arrange you know, a meeting with InterVarsity and Hermie or some of the crusade people and you guys and to, to really talk about how they can take DMM stuff and Discovery Bible Study and, and use that more on a campus. Because you know, every year InterVarsity or, or crew is doing that work. That's what they're doing on campus. Um, and then we lose that when they graduate because there's no one to catch them, right? They just go off into a cliff and 50% of them never make it into any church. And if they do make it into a church, they might make it into a church where they are told that they can hold babies and sit in the pew and give money, right? Instead of, oh, we need you to make disciples in the apartment building you live in. And we're going to coach you for that. So, um, you know, the, the, I think these people are the secret power of the church that we're, we're completely blind to. So... What do you see needs to kind of like shift in um, whether it's a mind shift, whether it's a cultural shift? I see we're very intentional yeah. about creating these as values as part of the culture. Yeah. Um, what are some some other shifts that you think need to take place for for this demographic really to start, not just to um, kind of uh, my, uh, see mitosis happen, yeah. but to see, see, see some multiplication? I, 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 I do think, um, you know, for a lot of these guys, they have not seen an adult come to Christ. And I think the moment you've seen one adult come to Christ, then you know that Jesus is seeking people, right? So when, when you first meet a person of peace, you meet a person of peace. So like, you know, one of my favorite stories is, you know, uh, an African-American gal in our ministry. She had a freshman roommate from China. And, you know, they just met that day. And they're setting up their room. And then they turn the lights out and they go to sleep. And the Chinese girl says, in the dark, do you know God? Because I've been looking, and nobody can talk to me. And my, you know, my student said, well, I know Jesus. I can talk to you about Jesus. And that led to this girl becoming a Christian. Now, that kid, that college kid, had never led a single person to Christ, had never had that experience. After that, she was an on-fire evangelist, right? So s seeing another person come to faith is such a huge transforming thing for a 20-something um, and, and I do think, you know, what Ben talks about, the, the whole notion of, of ripe tomatoes that, you know, it's hard to talk about people as tomatoes, that 20-somethings will hate that. But, but, to talk about, but to talk about people who are ready, who are ready. And that, and, that, and that Jesus is the seeker, right? You're not the seeker. Jesus is seeking. And we are just present to that. The other thing is... Um, uh, I think the whole social media world is completely untapped. Um, you know, with this age group, they, they look at social media as a way to stay in touch with all their college friends. They look at social media as a way to uh, promote things, to stay in touch with grandma. But, you know, you know to, I've talked to a few of them about, like, start up a second page. Don't call it your name. You know, call it, you know... Uh, Seeker, seeker friend, you know, or whatever, and then just post what you're learning in your faith, and 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 you'll be found, and, and you begin to develop a network that way. So, um, um, you know, I think if we had specific training for that, yeah. that would be a huge, huge thing because Instagram, you know, uh, 
people are just scrolling through, right, constantly. And in our culture, in Silicon Valley, you know, people don't go to secret churches anymore. They go to YouTube, right? Like, the secret church is kind of, it, it has some value, but, you know, YouTube has far more traction with, with people who are looking. So one of the shifts, so Hermie, thank you for asking that. So one of the big shifts is a, a shift from uh, uh, Everybody is, everybody is okay, everybody's equal to, there are people desperately hungering for God and, and, I, and we're not all the same. Because you know, when you're in your 20s, you know, people's alcoholism hasn't yet devastated their marriage. It just looks like he loves to party. Okay, I don't like to do that, but he just loves to party. And it's like, well, you haven't seen yet what that does you know, five years later when he's got little kids and uh, that's destroying a marriage. So people in their 20s have a very naive view of evil. Um, and, and how uh, someone who is a, a good person at work, a highly productive person, could be on the way towards Gollum, you know, like that that's the destination of their soul, that, that, that lostness, ultimate lostness. So that's a shift. The next shift is, uh, you know, the shift of actually having seen people come to Christ and valuing that as the greatest joy of life, right? Um, uh, Third shift is uh, that every disciple makes disciples, right? That, that that's just like, like we got to take that into our youth ministry. So I'm working on my youth pastor to work with our baptism kids that, that when you're a fifth grader, you should know every disciple makes disciples. If I'm signing up for the Christian faith, I want to get baptized in June, then okay, I am on the journey towards making disciples. Now, I, maybe right now I work with the fourth, four-year-olds I, once a month, I go with the four-year-olds and I tell them a story about Jesus. Well, that's maybe a risk that's appropriate for me as a fifth grader. Or maybe I invite my unchurched friends from school to my baptism, right? Like, that's a step for a fifth grader. But we've got this problem in America that, that people, it's a consumer salvation. I come to Jesus for my needs, not I come to Jesus who is starting a worldwide revolution of bringing everyone back to the Father. And that when I join Jesus, I'm joining that worldwide revolution. And so my job as a fifth grader is to become the kind of person who someday can make disciples. So, uh, you know, we have to go way back to, you know, like our young kids and how they view the faith. Now, you know, the problem is we have parents who don't necessarily see that as what it means to be a disciple. So, you know, that's an adjustment that we have to work on in the, in the American Christian Church. Rob. Um, so cool to hear your DNA of you know, every member of minister, uh, uh, including women, and uh, you know all called to make disciples. Uh, yesterday was our Cupertino monthly Cupertino pastors lunch. Oh, cool! In the time about evangelism, uh, we talked about some apartment complexes, South Asian yeah. Indians. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> any of our churches, you know, have inroads there. As, and as we were talking, I think one of the things that came my mind and a little bit of discussion was the whole idea of fivefold. Yeah. That what will the maybe the one five percent of folks in our churches who actually are gifted in the yeah. evangelism? Because sometimes we have kind of like a one size fits all. So yeah. if, every, if every member is a minister, well then I'm I'm not necessarily taking account of the evangelists in our yeah. group who might be just ready to go with the MM. But yeah. what I try to do is what's something that everyone would participate in and maybe I could create DBS to be something that everybody yeah. participates in equally. Yeah. And so the discussion was diversity of the gifts within the body. So therefore, should there be more of a diversity of how we equip people, uh, especially within the fivefold evangelist? Yeah. And that's what I'm kind of now wrestling with as I'm listening, going, well, I hear if you were to take your entire young adults group through a DMF process, you know, the pushback, yeah. like, oh, this doesn't fit. Yeah. And yet probably 5% would be like, ah, oh, finally, I've been waiting for this. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what have you guys processed with that tension? You know, and, and, and really with DMM, I don't know if the interest of Ben is still here. Should it be really a strategy that we take to really equip the evangelists within our church? Yeah. Uh, and then let that ripple out to others or what are, What's worked with maybe the, because we're all called to share our faith. So yeah. Need a, a answer. Yeah. But I do know even within Trinity, we've rolled out 
you know, T for T and DMN type principles. Mm. And you just see some people go, well, oh, yeah, you're yeah. right, I should. And yeah. There's no energy there. Yeah. Me. I'm curious what your thoughts are feeling. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I would defer to Tom and Hermie who, or, and uh, you guys who have thought more about it um, and have actually, you know, seen it in, in play in different, you know, different contexts, both with, uh, you know, people in recovery and then also in cross culturally in, in, in rural contexts. Just one thought is both Ben and Jan shared how they were introducing some of the DMN principles broadly mm -hmm. in congregations. So that there's some exposure and some background and terminology and some yeah. concepts that are there to build on. Um, how far you take that or whether you take a smaller group at the secondary, I mean, I would tend to take a smaller group and yeah. pilot it, it personally, um, make more progress a little faster that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. uh, at, but I think that I would do it both and. There's some level, that yeah. the easy um, to, the, to the masses and then take yeah. the pilot, it would be my inclination. In yeah. most cases. Yeah. yeah. I think, I mean, what we see going to some of these areas, um, it's really a team approach. It's not, it's mm. not just, just a, a one or two, you know, Jesus sooner, but, but Jesus really built a team. And, and there's, there's So give me an example of, of that, like say with your friend up in uh, San Francisco, the Latino guy, like how does that team approach work? So like for instance, I'll give you an example in Mayfair. Okay. Mayfair is a community in San Jose. Um, there's community engagement that's taking place. There is, similar to what you're seeing, there's some healing that takes place, mm. some taking care of the poor, there's some service and things like that. Then there's, there's, there's also, you know, some intense prayer yeah. that, that goes in there. There's, um, then there are folks that's gifted in evangelism. There's folks also gifted, like they're natural apostles. Yeah. You know, they look at, okay, it's cool that we're in this community, but hey, there's another community. It's cool that there's, we see a lot yeah. of Latinos, but where's the Vietnamese? Where's the yeah. Cambodians? Where's the, where's the white guys? So um, there's yeah. these different voices, and yeah. they, but they all need to kind of work together and provide that platform. Yeah. So uh, sometimes there's a group of two ladies. Mm. They love, they, they got the gift of hospitality. Mm. So they love to create an environment where people can, can be engaged, where people can uh, you know, have fun and all of that, yeah. that provides for some of the evangelistic kind of like those relationships, have the spiritual conversations, things yeah. like that. Then there's others that, man, they, evangelists kind of like, you know, they're, they like to keep moving, they love spending yeah. time with lost people. Then there's others that kind of like, I see more like Tom, just really kind of like a pastor and, and kind of like a, a teacher mm. that create those environments where, where, where we're going to rock with these folks long yeah. term. Not just to make them disciples, but also have them to make disciples become disciple makers. So it's kind of like a team approach. Yeah. Um, and because uh, one or two people don't always have the bandwidth yeah. to, to, to go all the way. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think yeah. you know, create an environment where it's not like everyone, we're all going to be Ricardos, we're all going to be Hermes. Yeah. No, people have different, and we need to have and value. The mm. different gifts and the different callings, but really it's about, it's it's not about just having community or we just serve the poor or just yeah. just have relationships. The main goal is the main goal is to make disciples and make disciples yeah. and see communities of believers as really churches emerge. Yeah. So um, I think we look different in different groups. The community looks like in one group we might have something where we all put on something, we invite people, we do something mm -hmm. as a team. Another one, uh, we might be encouraging people who have their person at the desk next to them. Yeah. So we're all praying for one another, encouraging each other to be Christ in our own environment, and mm. supporting, encouraging, and coaching one another. Uh, we may have someone in our group who's more on the front lines, and the rest of the group is trying to find ways, how can we support, be a part of this, yeah. and pray with that together. So I think it could look different in different small groups, but the idea, as Hermie was saying, is the small group has a, a sense of mission, yeah. a missional, and, uh, and then we're trying to decide how God wants us to express yeah. that, and we recognize that we have different roles, different parts. Nobody, 98%, I think, of the Christians I talk to say, I'm not an evangelist, I can't do that. Yeah. We've got to press people to go a little bit beyond what they think is possible. Part of it also is I think that We've, we've built, you know, evangelists as Billy Graham. We've, you know, we've, we've got some bad ideas on mm -hmm. what some of these five-fold gifts look like. We need to 
bring it yeah. down to what this looks like in a normal uh, layperson's church yeah. expression. Yeah. And uh, and this is how you, you know you really have this gift. You don't even know it. Yeah. Because you don't stand up front and preach on Sundays. But yeah, you're you're. You know, let me encourage you to, yeah. to share that in this um, group here um, yeah. in, a, in a very different way. Yeah. I think a lot has to do, it's not, I, I think sometimes, like you say, Tom, we have this baggage on an evangelist, uh, an apostle, you, you yeah. know, all of those. I think for the most part, I've, I've seen people that are very gifted at, at Expanding God's kingdom through disciple making, and they would call themselves introverts, shy people. Yeah, not interesting. Salesperson. What I see a commonality in all of these folks, they have passion for the lost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like they discover that pearl, that treasure, mm. and it's it compels them. Yeah. To share that. Mm. And um, so I think the more we can kind of like create yeah. authentic. And it seems like this is this this demographic really. There's some things playing against that. You know what you what you highlighted some of the barriers. So yeah. I think we need to look. How can we kind of create real and authentic passion for the lost? Because yeah. I think that, and it's not so much the script or the this or the that to kind of like debate or things yeah. like that. It's that genuine. It's like man, you know, like you say, you're seeing this, but you've seen the tape played yeah. forward. Yes. It's, it's it's not a good ending. So those yeah. people are are are. A lot more effective at evangelism slash discipleship. Yeah, yeah, and and the people that I see who have the core, uh, you know, in my in this cohort of young adults, you know, interestingly, it's the South Asians. They have the greatest passion.